Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's talk about the notion of primary decomposition of modules. So suppose I have a module M. So the setup is the following. Suppose M is a module over an integral domain R. Okay, So integral domain remember means that R is a commutative ring without any zero divisors. Okay, So if I have a module over an integral domain then it makes sense to define the following notion. So here's a definition. So it's a subset of M, we'll call it tor of M. This is the set of all elements M in M such that there exists a element A in R, A is not zero such that A acting on M gives me zero. So if I scalar multiply m by a, then I get 0 for some non-zero a. Okay. So the set of all such elements is uh, denoted tor of m. So observe, of course, 0, the, the element 0 of the module is certainly in tor of m. And in fact, here's a little lemma. Tor of m is actually a submodule of m. So tor m is a submodule. Okay, so let's check uh, what does this involve. So we need to check that the um, well, it's closed under addition as well as under scalar multiplication. So suppose I have two elements m1 and m2 in tor m. Uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, you know there exists a1, a2, both non-zero elements of the ring R such that a1 kills m1, a2 kills m2. And now the question is, uh, so suppose I, I, I now want to show that m1 plus m2 is also in tor m for which I must produce an element, uh, a non-zero element which kills m1 plus m2. Okay. So observe that uh, there is a ready-made element which will do the job which is the product of a1 and a2. So if I look at a1, a2 times m1 plus m2, so uh, since the ring is commutative, I can switch the, the order of a1, a2 as I choose. Um, so for example, in the first, uh, so I'll use the distributivity property. In the first uh, term, I will write, think of it as a2, a1 acting on m1 and in the second term as a1, a2 acting on m2. Now a1, m1 is 0, a2, m2 is 0. So this is just going to be the element 0 of my module. The other important uh, observation here is that this scalar a which kills m1 plus m2, let's call it a, this guy is not 0. Okay, and why is that? Because both a1 and a2 were non-zero and the ring was assumed to be an integral domain to start with. Okay, So this is an important uh, observation here since a1 and a2 are both non-zero and the ring r is an integral domain, a itself is not 0. Okay, so what does this imply? This means that m1 plus m2, this element, is also in tor of m because it's killed by some non-zero scalar. Now, similarly, we need to look at uh, the, the next property, which is that if I'm given, so this is the first axiom of being a submodule, uh, second axiom, so let's go to the next page. So if I take an element of tor m, I need to show that any scalar multiple of that is also in tor m. So I need to look at any, any scalar multiple, let me call it Sm, uh, S is any element of the ring R. I need to prove that this is also a, an element of tor M. Now, if M is in tor M means it is killed by some scalar A, there exists A non-zero in R such that A M is 0. Now, observe that the same A will do the job. Now, observe this means that if I look at A acting on Sm by the axiom, of the, the module axiom. This is AS acting on M, but AS is the same as SA because the ring is commutative and now that is the same as S acting on AM and that is of course 0. Okay, So we, we keep using the fact that the ring is commutative 
and also we use the fact that it is an integral domain. So what does this mean? So finally this proves the lemma therefore the lemma is proved. So in particular it implies that tor m is a sub module. Okay. Now uh, so we call uh, element so this is called tor m is usually called the torsion sub module. Okay. This is called the torsion sub module of m and the elements of tor m are usually called torsion elements. So, if I, if I have an element m in tor m is usually called a torsion element. Any, any element of tor m is called a torsion element. Okay. So, this is the first um, uh, little definition and property that uh, we need. Now, if m itself is tor m, so this is the definition, if every element is a torsion element, so if m itself coincides with its sub module tor m, then we say m is a torsion module, m is said to be a torsion module. Okay. And uh, another little uh, remark. Uh, another way of, of sort of thinking about this, this definition torsion modules. So, we can uh, fix an element. So, fix an element m in m and define what is called its annihilator. So, the annihilator of that element m is all elements of the ring which annihilate it, all elements of the ring such that A acting on m is 0. Okay. So, this is the definition it's called the annihilator of m and it is an easy exercise which I will leave you to do uh, that this is an ideal. So, annihilator of any element is always an ideal of the ring A is an ideal. Uh, it is an ideal of r. Okay. So, we had used the fact that r is commutative in this case. So, the annihilator is an ideal and uh, check and the, the torsion elements are so m is an element of tor m is another way of saying that its annihilator is not the zero ideal it certainly contains at least one non zero element okay so this is another uh, equivalent way of thinking about uh, torsion elements, they are exactly the elements whose annihilator is not zero. Okay. Now, uh, let me define the, the key objects that we will be interested in which are called the primary components or the primary sub modules. Okay, so, this is like uh, well the definition is very similar. So, so let us do the following let P be a prime element of the ring R. So, R is an integral domain and uh, you know what the definition of prime elements are. They have the property that if P divides a product A B then P must divide one of them. Okay, so, if I have a prime element then uh, so, uh, throughout I am making the same assumption that R is an integral domain and M is a module over R, uh, we can define what is called M sub P. Okay. So, what is this? This is almost like the definition of the torsion module. Uh, you take those elements of M which are annihilated by some power of P such that P power K annihilates M for some K greater than or equal to 0 greater than or equal to 1. Okay. So, what does this mean? Uh, it is like torsion element some sense. So, so, observe the most obvious inclusion here an element is an MP of course, means it is a torsion element because it is killed by some power of P okay. and a power of P here since P is non-zero power of P cannot be 0 also. Okay. So, this is a special kind of um, torsion element which are killed by powers of the fixed prime p 
and the key point here is that MP is also a sub module. So, observe that MP is a sub module of tor m or m, MP is in fact a sub module. Okay, and why is this? Well, the proof is almost the same as what we did in the case of tor m. So, I will just quickly indicate the proof. Observe if I have two elements m1 and m2, and if m1 is killed by some power of p, p to the k1, and m2 is killed by p to the k2, then in this case m1 plus m2 is certainly going to be killed by, well, certainly the higher of the two is enough. So, I just need to take p raised to the maximum of k1 and k2. I do not even need to take the product. Okay. And similarly, the other axiom. Okay, so it's a it's a very easy, quick check that MP is in fact a submodule. Okay, and this this submodule is called the P primary component. So we usually call this the so this is for the fixed prime P. This is called the P primary submodule or the P primary component of M. Okay, it's really a sub of tor M rather than all of them. Okay, now, uh, let us make a further assumption on, on R so now. So, I am going to make an additional assumption. Let R be a PID, okay, a principal ideal domain. So, which means not just an integral domain, but one in which every ideal is generated by a single element. Okay, so, suppose I have distinct primes now. So, let uh, P1, P2, PR be distinct primes, pairwise distinct primes in the ring R. Now, for each of them, I can look at the corresponding P primary or PI primary component. Okay? So, look at MPI, which is all elements which are annihilated by some power of PI. Okay? So, these are the um, uh, primary components. I claim that these these submodules corresponding to distinct primes are so then here is the little lemma MPI i goes from 1 to r are what we will call independent submodules. Okay. Uh, what does independent mean? Well, uh, this is something we encountered while talking about direct products of many submodules and so on. What it says is that the, the submodule generated by these uh, R, you know, by, by MP1, MP2, MPR, the union of these, that is just their internal direct sum. Okay? Uh, so, let me write this out properly. So, they are independent, i.e., what do I mean? Uh, let N denote the submodule generated by their union. So, let this be the submodule of N of M. generated by these M MPIs 1 to R. Now, what is this really? So, we usually write this like this MP1 plus MP2 plus MPR. In other words, the submodule is, well, what does it comprise? Exactly elements which are of the form X1 plus X2 plus XR, where each XI comes from one of the M MPIs. So, this is actually the collection of all sums x1, x2, xr, where each xi comes from the appropriate submodule MPI. So, this is exactly the submodule generated by their union. Okay? So, let n denote the submodule uh, generated by their union, then n is just the direct sum, the internal direct sum. n is actually the internal direct sum of these guys. This is what independence means. Okay. So, independence just saying that the sort of the sum of those submodules is actually the direct sum of the submodules. Okay. And if you recall what this direct sum means going back to the lecture on uh, uh, direct sums and so on, this just says that if you take an element, so let us call such an element x, which is a sum of these xrs, then x can be written in this manner in a unique way. Okay. Each element x uh, in, in the sum of these submodules is can be written as x1 plus x2 plus xr, where each xi comes from MPI uh, in a unique manner. Okay? So, i.e., 
So, all this is really unraveling the definition of independence i.e. what I mean is uh, each x in n has a unique expression as a sum x1 plus x2 plus xr with each xi coming from the appropriate sub module for all i. Okay, so, this is my definition of independence. Okay, so, it is a lengthy definition, but the proof itself is very simple. So, let us prove this. What do we need to show? We need to show that if uh, x has two such expressions, then those two expressions coincide. Okay, so, here is the proof. So, let us suppose x. So, let us pick an x in n. So, let us take x in n and if possible, if this guy has two different such expressions x1, x2, xr also y1, y2, yr okay, where xi and yi come from mpi for all i. Then, so as is standard in all these proofs, we subtract the two expressions. So, this implies that uh, if I take x i minus y i, so I call those as z i's. This means that z 1 plus z 2 plus z r is 0, where my definition of z i, it is just x i minus y i. Okay, and observe the difference of these two guys is also in the module MPI. Okay, so now I have this. Now from here, I will try and uh, prove that each of the z i's is 0, which is all I need. So observe that what are these z i's? Well, they all belong to the appropriate MPI's means the following means that some power of pi, so let me call that power ki, pi power ki kills z i okay, for some numbers k i is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so, what does this mean? Uh, I, uh, so, let us start out. I want to prove that z 1 is 0 for example. So, to do that, let us let me do the following. I will multiply this left hand side by p 2 power k 2, p 3 power k 3 and so on. Okay. So, let, let me start here. So, what do I mean? Z 1 plus Z 2 plus Z r is 0. So, let us multiply both sides of this equation by p 2 power k 2. This is a scalar now. This is an element of the ring. This is a scalar that I want to use. Okay. So, this acting on z 1 plus z 2 plus z r is 0. Now, observe that if I look at the other term z 2, z 3 till z r, each of them is killed by an appropriate power of p 2. right? So, this scalar p 2 uh, power k 2 till p r power k r, it kills all the terms in this sum except for z 1 itself. Okay, So, all the other fellows are 0. Z1 alone survives. It's P2, P3 till PR power KR acting on Z1. Okay. Now uh, remember, however, we also knew that Z1 was killed by P1 to the power K1. Okay. So these are my two equations, which will tell me that Z1 itself must be zero. Why is this? Because observe these two equations are of the following form. It says that z1 is annihilated by two elements. Okay? So, what does this mean? It says that p1 power k1 belongs to the annihilator of z1 and the, the other product p2 k2 till pr kr also belongs to the annihilator. Okay? But Remember these two elements p1 to the k1 and p2, p3, pr to the corresponding ki's, these two elements are relatively prime, right? They do not have any common prime factors here. So, what does that mean? So, if you recall from the lecture on PIDs and so on, this means that so, but the GCD of these two elements is 1 means that the ideal generated by them. So, look at the ideal generated by these two elements. This ideal is just the whole ring. It is the ideal generated by 1. Okay. So, what does that mean? In particular, it means that, so remember I have already said, let us go back here. I have said P1 to the K1 belongs to the, this belongs to the annihilator. 
and this belongs to the annihilator okay which means that the ideal generated by the two of them is a subset of the annihilator okay so i but then that ideal is the whole ring r okay so which means that the ring r itself must be the annihilator right so but remember i know that this ideal generated by these two elements must be contained in the annihilator of z1 which means that the annihilator is the whole ring there is no other way out in particular it means that the specific element 1 annihilates z1 which means that 1 must annihilate z1 what does that mean that just means z1 is 0 okay now the same proof applies to the to the other elements you can just uh, replace uh, z1 by any of the other z i's multiply by the product of all the prime factors other than the ith prime factor okay so the proof works similarly for the other cases okay so that that's the end of the proof so what have we proved uh, if you take um, the 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 primary components corresponding to distinct primes are always independent meaning their sum is actually the direct sum okay now uh, that's one thing done that's an important um, statement and now here's the the main theorem that we shall be interested in okay which concerns primary components so if i have r so i i'll put in a few more assumptions now if r is a pid that i already used and m is uh, r module but uh, i need some more adjectives i want m to be a finitely generated okay torsion module so remember torsion module means every element of m is a torsion element it's killed by some uh, non zero element of the ring so I have thrown in these two adjectives, it should be finitely generated and it should be a torsion module okay? over this ring R. Uh, then if R is a PID and M is a finitely generated torsion R module, then two statements, one these primary components MP is zero for all but finitely many primes for all but finitely many so notice that the ring itself may have infinitely many primes for all but finitely many primes p of r okay the ring may have infinitely many primes but we are saying that the primary component mp will be zero for all, for almost all those primes okay except for some finitely many of them and statement 2 so let's give these primes a name uh, for all but finitely many primes uh, p of r so let's call these uh, primes um, p1 p2 pr for all but finitely many primes say p1 p2 pr so i'll just give the primes a name of r. okay so m mp1 mp2 mpr are the the only ones which are non zero and property 2 says m is actually the direct sum of these mpis you take the non zero primary components whichever primes give you non zero answers and the direct sum of those primary components is actually the whole module m okay so we we've, we've already um, developed many of the ingredients we need for this proof so uh, so observe that m is finitely generated so i'm going to use all my hypotheses so first let's take let x1 x2 xr uh, maybe not the same r xn be uh, generators okay so remember finitely generated module just means there are finitely many elements uh, such that the submodule generated by these finitely many elements by the set of these elements is the whole module Okay, so let x1, x2, xn be generators of m. Uh, what does that mean? In other words, m is just the span. Okay, to use a vector space term, this is just all elements of the form ci, xi, linear combinations of these generators. The set of all such elements will give you the entire module m. 
Okay, now this is the first assumption that it is finitely generated. Now, let me use my second assumption. I am also given that m is tor m. Okay, that m is a torsion module. In particular, it means that each of these generators is a torsion element. Okay, so which means that uh, each generator x i is uh, has a non-zero annihilator, right? It's it's got at least one non-zero element which annihilates it. And remember, in this case, uh, I I have assumed that R is a PID, right? A principal ideal domain. So and recall, I already mentioned the annihilator is a ideal of my ring R. Okay, so it's uh, since the ring is a PID, this ideal must be singly generated. Okay, there must be a principal ideal. Okay, so the annihilator looks like this for some di which is not zero. So, I have used the fact it is m is torsion and r is a PID. So, both assumptions have been used in this step. Okay, And this is for all i, this is for all i equals 1 to n. Okay, Now, where are we going to manufacture these primes from? Where, what are those finitely many primes? They are going to come from the di's. Okay, so, look at the di's. Uh, I have a principal ideal domain which uh, if you recall is also a unique factorization domain. I can factorize every element of R uniquely into a product of, of powers of primes. So, I look at this prime factorization of all the di's. Okay. So, consider uh, you know each di has a prime factorization, each di has a prime factorization. So, I can look at all the primes which occur in the factorizations of all the di's. Okay, so that's going to be my um, my set of primes. Okay, so consider the set P. So consider P uh, prime of R such that P occurs in the prime factorization. In other words, P divides di for some i. Okay, so I will take the union of the prime factors of all the i's. So, for some i from 1 to n. So, take the collection of all primes which divide the di's and this is only a finite set because there are only finitely many di's and each di will have some finitely many prime factors. Okay, So, this, this full collection of primes which I get let, let me call them p1, p2, pr. Okay. Now, uh, consider uh, these mpi's the claim is that uh, m is actually the direct sum of these mpi's okay so i'm going to prove the second part of my my theorem which is that um, i can find finitely many primes such that m is the direct sum of those guys then i'll show that for all the other primes np is actually zero okay so m is um, uh, the direct sum that is the claim. Okay, so, let us try and prove this claim now. Okay, so, recall we have already shown independence. Okay, so, which means that I, I, I know that um, these MPIs their sum is equal to the direct sum that I have already shown. Okay, so, proof recall we already showed independence meaning the sub module generated by these components is actually a direct sum. Okay. So, what remains to show is that this sum m p 1 plus dot 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 m p r this is equal to the whole module m. Okay. So, I need to show that every element of m can be obtained as a sum of elements uh, x 1 plus x 2 plus x r coming from the corresponding mi's. Okay, so, only remains to show that each element of m lies in the sum m p 1 dot 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 m p r. Okay. 
and in fact i don't need to worry about every element of m being the sum it's enough to prove that the generators belong okay because if once the xi is belong then every other element is after all linear combination of the xi's right so they they would also automatically belong so it's really a question of showing that the generators uh, belong so let me just say i don't even need to do this i can actually do something simpler i can just show that the generators xi only remains to show that xi lies in this sum for all i equals 1 to 1 okay so this is a simpler step so let's try proving this okay so now uh, to do this we need a, a little lemma so let me state my lemma first so i need to show every generator belongs so here's an intermediary step it's a lemma let a be a non zero element of r okay and suppose i have an element of m which is annihilated by a such that a x is here okay now if a can be written as a product b times c suppose a can be written like this with b and c relatively prime okay so i am able to split a into two pieces and the two pieces are relatively prime then i can split x into two pieces as a sum of two pieces y and z with the following property that y is killed by b and z is killed by c okay so where uh, what are y and z also elements of uh, i should have said with y z belonging to m okay so what is this this proposition it's an, it's an interesting statement it says that if x is annihilated by a and a can be split into these two pieces well split now means as a product of two relatively prime elements of the ring then the element that it annihilates the element x can also be written as a sum of two elements y and z where y is killed by one part of a that is by b and z is killed by c okay so uh, it's an interesting little statement and the proof is rather simple so observe that since a can be written as bc with b and c one so all this is under the same assumption as my theorem that r is a pid so observe as before gcd of b and c is one means that the ideal generated by b and c is the the whole ring which means the ideal generated by bc is one the whole ring which implies in particular that i can write uh, some one as a linear combination for some r and s belonging to the ring r okay so this is the this is the important property that we keep using now observe that so this this is where my splitting is going to come from so my element x which i want to split into two pieces i think of it as one times x and one i write as rb plus sc acting on x okay so what is this this is r b x plus s c x and these are going to be my y and z okay so let me define uh, y and z here so this fellow here is going to be y so i will define y to be this element and i will define z to be this element okay so these are my definitions so we need to check that these two elements do the job uh, what does that mean well i uh, of course their elements of m is clear but let's check that they are annihilated by b and c respectively okay so for y let's check suppose i hit y with b what is by well this is b acting on scx okay but now i can use my properties uh, of the module the axioms of a module this is bscx and use the fact that the ring is commutative think of it as sbcx and sbc is just s a x okay because b c is a and a x was zero okay so this just shows that b y is zero and the proof for z is similar so you hit a c on r b and then combine the b and the c together to get an a so this is the same proof okay so we are done so what this means is that uh, if you have a as a product of b c then x can also be similarly split in as y times z y plus z 
Now, why is this interesting or important for us? Because uh, we are trying to show the following that each element x i lies in this sum, right. Uh, wh what that means is I need to be able to split x i into several smaller pieces. I need to be able to write x i as a sum of an element from m p 1 plus another element from m p 2 and so on till an element from m p r. Now, this splitting comes because of this lemma. Why? Because the element x 1 is killed by some element d i, right. So, now observe, let us go back to the proof of the theorem. So, let us now complete uh, back to the proof of the theorem. So, let us do the th proof now, back to proof of theorem. So, what we need to do here is to say, uh, let us look at this element x i, it is killed by d i, right, that is the property we started out with. But d i can be written in terms of its prime factorization. So, I just factorize d i. So, what, what is d i? It will be some, some prime. Uh, so, well, we have, we have called those primes p 1, p 2, p r. So, maybe I will just use that. So, let me say d i looks like p 1 to the uh, k 1. Um, so, uh, okay. So, let us just do this. So, I mean the i's and so on are not so important. Anyway, so let us do this. So, p 1 to the k 1, p 2 to the k 2 till p r to the k r. Okay. And now, of course, not all the primes will occur in the factorization of all the d i's necessarily. So, I will just say the k i's could be 0 or some number greater than equal to 0. So, I take the prime factorization. The key point is that only p 1, p 2, p r can occur. None of the other primes can occur in this decomposition because that is how I define my primes. I took the d i's, I factorized each of them and I collected together all the primes that result. Okay. So, the d i is this, this product. Now, uh, what does this imply? Uh, now, let us use the lemma. So, by the lemma, so I am now going to first split this d i into two pieces. I will look at p 1 to the k 1 and the rest. Okay. So, I will think of this as my a, uh, sorry, to apply the lemma, I will think of this as my a, this as my b and this element as my c. Okay. b and c remember are relatively prime, a is a product and a which is d i kills x i. Okay. So, now by lemma, what can I do? I know that x i can be split into two pieces. I can write it as, so let me just call it for now y 1 plus uh, z 1, y 1 is killed by b, z 1 is killed by c. Okay, so, I split into two pieces, but uh, C itself is again a similar sort of thing. It is a product of the remaining primes from P2 onwards. Okay, now, I can repeat the analysis with C. What do I mean by that? Uh, so, here is what we will do. We will think of Z1, C Z1 is 0, start with this equation, apply the lemma again to C. Okay, so, what does C look like? It is this product. Again, I split into two pieces. So, let us try using some other color. So, this first uh, term alone is separate, the remaining terms are separate. Okay. So, when I write c, I will think of writing c as a product of p 2 power k 2. So, maybe I will just do this here, c can be written as p 2 to the k 2 is one term and all the rest is another term. Okay. And these two are relatively prime, again apply the lemma. It says that if, if c kills z 1, then z 1 can be again split into two pieces. So, I will let me call this y 2 plus z 2. Okay. Now, what property does it have? So, I have replaced this equation by uh, there is an element called y 2 which is killed by p 2 to the k 2 and there is the element z 2 which is killed by the product of the remaining prime factors. Okay. Now, repeat the process with z 2. z 2 again will split into two pieces y 3 plus z 3, z this will split into two pieces y 4 plus z 4 and so on. So, this is some sort of inductive procedure. Okay. So, what are you finally doing? You are successively splitting this x i into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Okay? So, I hope you are convinced that what we get at the end of this process is the final equation. This x i here has been written as y 1 plus y 2 plus y r, where each y i has the following property that y i or y j is killed by the corresponding some power of p j. So, p j power k j acting on y j is 0. one to r. Okay. And, and this implies that y j is 
belong to the corresponding M uh, PJs. Okay, so this completes the proof because what we have done therefore is to show that each of the generators, so recall this is what we needed to show here, that each of the generators, each uh, element xi of m lies in the sum of these elements. Okay, now uh, there was still the, the other part of the theorem which we needed to prove, right, let us go up. So we have, we have done this, show that m is actually the direct sum, but why, why are all the other mp is 0? Okay. Um, let us just prove that the remaining MPs are all 0 as a consequence of what we have just proved. Okay, still need to show the last bit of the theorem. Uh, now, let us claim if P is not one of the PIs, then MP must be a 0. Okay, why is this? Uh, well, again, let us see proof. Suppose I have an element in MP, suppose x belongs to MP, what does this mean? It means that it is killed by some power of P, right? P power k x is 0. For some k greater than or equal to 1. Now, uh, we have already shown that x is just the, the direct sum of um, uh, you know the MPIs. So, let me first write x as uh, x1 plus ok. So, uh, we, we can write x as a sum x1 plus x2 plus xr where each xi comes from the corresponding mpi. Now, p to the kx is therefore p to the kx1 plus dot 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 p to the kxr okay, and this is a 0 that is our assumption. Okay. Now, observe that each of these terms p to the kx1 is in the, the first module mp1 Right, because it is just x1 multiplied by some, some scalar and this guy is in the final module MPR and what are we obtaining here that a sum of elements from these different submodules is a 0. Okay. But we have already shown that these submodules are independent which means that if you know the, the element 0 if it can be written as a sum of elements from these modules each of those, those components must be a 0. So, this means by the independence of the M MPIs that each of these p to the k x i is 0 okay, uh, for all i equals 1 to r and why is this by the independence. Okay, now, again we are uh, you know we just repeat the familiar argument what does this mean? it means that p power k belongs to the annihilator of x i. Okay. Uh, we, we also know that uh, well the annihilator of x i is d i. Okay. Uh, so, what does this mean? This says that so, p to the k is in the annihilator and so, this means that um, I mean we can we can complete the proof in, in one of two ways. So, observe that p to the k and d i are, are relatively prime here. So, I mean just to repeat the sort of argument we have used before. So, observe p to the k. So, remember p is not one of those primes which divides d i. So, p to the k and d i are actually relatively prime to each other which means that uh, both p to the k and d i are elements of annihilator of x. So, this means that uh, the ideal generated by p to the k and d i must be the whole thing but both of them are, are in the annihilator. So, this means that the ideal generated by them is in the annihilator and like we already did before this means that x i is 1 is in the annihilator which means x i is 0 which is a contradiction. So, we, we assume to start with that x i was a non-zero element. I mean they are the non-zero generators. Okay. So, uh, so th I mean th maybe I, I did not put that into the my initial step of the proof. So, let us go up. Um, 
B non zero I mean there is no point in taking a zero generator here B non zero generators of M. So, uh, these D i's are are not units. So, this is this is not the whole whole um, whole ring here ok. So, that that completes the proof of this theorem. So, this is a this is a very interesting and important theorem it says that when you have a finitely generated torsion module over a P i d then you know torsion means everything is killed by some element of the ring, but it is actually enough to just look at prime power elements ok. Just look at things which are killed by powers of some primes ok and only finitely many such primes finally matter all the other guys are 0 and those finitely many primes will you know they, they will sort of uh, the, the, the primary components of those when you take the direct sum that will give you the whole module m ok. Mm -hmm.